My name is Tanya Joshua. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy at the Office of Insular Affairs in the U.S. Department of the Interior. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of OIA Conversations, where we speak with leaders and officials to learn more about programs and issues that are important in the U.S. territories and in the freely associated states. Today we are having a conversation with Josie Howard, Program Director of We Are Oceania, a nonprofit organization in Honolulu that recently received funding, funding from OIA, CARES Act grant funding to help Pacific Islander populations in Hawaii that have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. I am joined also by Philippe Izadian, a Duke University student who is providing important support uh, for this OIA conversation series. So thank you for joining us today, Josie. How are you? No, thank you for the opportunity. It's my <laughs> pleasure. Mm. Um, Josie, could you tell us a little bit about We Are Oceania and oh, how it first started? For a long time, our community had um, always wanted something like a one-stop, uh, a place similar to our canoe houses uh, or our meeting NAS, uh, meeting houses, right, uh, back home that when people arrive on the island, they can come to and get oriented. Um, I would say starting in 1990, we began to see a mass migration of Micronesians to Hawaii. Um, and so when I graduated from college, my undergrad uh, moving to Oahu, um, right away, you know, I, I began to see how uh, service providers were struggling in understanding um, our, how to work effectively with our population. And also for working uh, with my own family and with uh, community members, realizing the differences in culture, the differences in the systems that created the, you know, this great need of people needing a one-stop center or a canoe house, uh, if I may use that term. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so when you say your community, can you just clarify again, uh, Who's the community in Honolulu? Um, uh, the community is the Micronesian community. Um, I know right now uh, we define the Micronesian community by either COVA citizens, and um, that's limiting it to the you know the Compact of Free Association nations, uh, Republic of Palau, Republic of the Marshall Islands, and uh, the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, However, our service is also open to Micronesians, the other Micronesians, you know, we have um, in Saipan, we have members of those communities that had migrated uh, before the compact or during the compact and, uh, or before the compact and now are considered, um, uh, how would I say, citizens or people of Saipan but they're culturally actually were people from Yeah, from Chuk, from Punpe, um, and that's the Carlinian, right? Our service is open to all Micronesian. Yes. How, how big is that population? Micronesian. Oh, how big is that population in Hawaii? So when we began to work on, you know, you know getting the initiative, uh, like getting WOW going, on our understanding and estimated uh, number was, 15 to 20,000 uh, people. I, at this point, I think that number had, uh, you know, gotten bigger. Uh, I really think that there's maybe about 30,000 Micronesians here in Hawaii. Well, we will be waiting to see that census 2020 come out and- I know. Did you work on the census and working with these communities to make sure they're counted? Look at the picture behind me, my, my, my background, beautiful background. That is our youth summit. And you can see, notice some of their signs that says, I am Chugis, I am Tongan, and I think I'm Hawaiian, or this Ohana counts. Those were posters that were created by the Napi, uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islands uh, group that supports or uh, try to uh, do out outreach and promote the census so that people, uh, more people can participate. Um, I think, you know, in getting the right number, it's, it's been very difficult because our populations uh, don't really, um, haven't really uh, participated in this census in the past. So 
based on that, we really work hard this past year, 2020, to get more of our people to participate and you know um, complete their census so that we can get a good count. Uh, and especially with um, with COVID, because it kind of you know it, it, COVID hit right in March here in Hawaii, and that reveals a lot of the disparities and understanding how data is so important. Uh, you know, to serve the needs. And uh, of course, we couldn't escape but help <laughs> uh, the initiative of, of educating our Pacific Island population here in Hawaii. So, um, Josie, so just for the record, maybe for our viewers, folks who come from the Freedy Associated States are legally, are allowed to come to the US and live and work and study as provided for under the compacts. Um, and it might not be a question that you can answer, but I was curious, what are the numbers, you know, would you say there are more uh, citizens who, folks who have come and are U.S. citizens now, or is it more that they are compact citizens? Do you, do you have a general sense of, of what that difference is? Um, like you said, I may not be able to answer the full question, but I can answer it from my estimate. And, um, you know, for us COFA citizen, we cannot come and become U.S. citizen easily, like, like any other immigrant population. Uh, because of our treaty, the relationship, it really like, it's like no need for us to become citizen. Um, so only our children who are born in the U.S. and also um, our member, um, member of our community that are in the military can go for citizenship. Uh, now with that, with people like me, who came out and have a family and now are building a family here in Hawaii. So there's me and my husband, two of us in our household, and we have three children. And those three children are US citizen and there's two COVA citizen. So using that model and kind of like, you know, estimating, I really think that there's probably more US citizen than COVA citizen. And from my understanding when the, uh, GAO do their reports, uh, they, they include our COVA citizens who are 18 and under in that count. You know, when they, they count um, um, the COVA citizens here in Hawaii or in America, they include the 18 and under. Um, so that's- Who, who might bit, actually, they might US. actually be US citizens. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Um, if we could just go back really quick, shortly, briefly, uh, Josie, where do you hail from originally? I hail from the beautiful, the most happiest island uh, of Onon in Namanwede Atoll in Chuuk State of the Federated States of Micronesia. And you have been in Hawaii now for decades, I think. Oh my God. It's, I think for more than 30 years, I came out in, 1989 yeah uh, and so you came for school and and you ended up now you're you're part of the Hawaii uh, community yes uh, like any other like my colleagues my friends that we I think there were 10 of us that came out at that time go to UH Chilo. we um, we all went to school to go back home and serve our country um, I found myself stuck here uh, and I thought it was temporary because I wanted to continue with my master's degree. Um, however, my sister got sick and um, she was diagnosed with cancer back home. Mm -hmm. uh, she came here and we actually found out it wasn't cancer, which was good news, but uh, she had renal failure, both. Mm -hmm. And that was a sudden life change for her and for me. That's my only sister, and um, there's no way I will leave her here by herself. And I have to make a decision. My husband and I have to make a decision uh, that we will stay here, uh, you know, to care for her. And then now our children are grown up, and um, education opportunity is better here. In a way, I'm kind of like stuck on expectedly, but I'm taking, I guess, the I'm taking this as my calling and I'm serving my country in a way. Yes. Uh, so when did you start, uh, when did WOW start? We are Oceania, when did it start? 
So Wow was actually born in August of 2015. Um, and I mean, I have to say we are very grateful to uh, the Department of Interior because um, the idea and the dream of having a one stop was always there. And we, I remember going to meetings with the governors of Hawaii at that time. And, uh, you know, when the, every time they ask us, what is the great need of your community? We always say a one stop. And it wasn't considered one of the uh, low hanging ulu or breadfruit because it's expensive, it's costly. Um, and when we had uh, our conference, uh, the first Micronesian Voices Conference, everyone, like over 300 people, all agreed that a one stop was needed. Um, so until we were able to get funding, um, that we actually stood up, we are Oceania. So that became possible through the Office of Interior or ORIA. And we should give a shout out to the former Assistant Secretary Esther Kia Aina who was Definitely. assistant secretary at the time and uh, Definitely. made that funding available. Um, so can you tell me what, what specifically does We Are Oceania do in Hawaii? What is the void that it filled? Well, aside from the one stop, what, what is the work that you're doing or were you doing before COVID? That's a really great, great question because um, it can be very tricky. You know, when you're addressing the need of the community, our hope and our, our vision is that we, you know, like that Chinese proverb says, uh, you feed a man a fish, you feed him for one day, but you teach a man how to fish, you feed him for the rest of your life. So, that, so that's, that's our philosophy and that's what we wanna do. So we hope that our service is really to empower and to, uh, to uh, yeah, to empower our people to be able to navigate for themselves, you know, with a lot of people needing healthcare coverage, that became one of our first uh, responsibility to build up the structure within so that we can be able to help the state enroll our people into Obamacare. Um, you know, we were taken off the MedQuest in 2014 uh, and in 2000, not 2000, 1996, we were um, removed from the Medicaid program or um, yeah, from the Medicaid program. And so it made like maybe about 7,600 of our people not having any health coverage. And so with our initiative, we were able to help a lot of people um, to have and health I, coverage. I, I understand Hawaii State uh, contracted you to, to help them find communities, provide that support for them, sort yeah. of liaise between the communities and the state? Yes, and I think um, we build a model that is kind of new to the state and a model that employs our own community members that speaks the language and that has the cultural knowledge so that when people come to us, and one thing that is underlying is of course having the relationship, right? Um, and so when people come to us, they're comfortable, you know, they can speak the language and um, it just made things a lot easier. Um, and then we look at the rate of when people get into, you know, like apply for coverage and receive the coverage. Uh, with our help, it really expedite or speed up that process. And just because, you know, we spoke, we speak the language and we understand the culture. Can you give an example of where maybe the cultural differences were causing problems in, uh, sure. in services? A lot of the services now are online and or may need to have a email address so that, you know, when they intake um, someone or even with the, with the um, Obamacare, you need to have an email address in order for you to create your profile, right? And then once you create that, then you can apply. A lot of our folks don't have emails. You know, our elderly don't have emails. They also don't have access to computer. Uh, and a lot of service providers lack that knowledge that our people may be computer illiterate or maybe not even understanding like what is an email and not having access. For us, we knew that already. 
So it was easy. It, it made us more proactive. And I think at least I can speak to me as you know the director of the program and in building these programs, uh, understanding those facts uh, helped us a lot in building up a system that was ready to, when they come in, uh, it speed up the process because then we don't have to wait. We had to you know, help them to create the email address. So when they come in to enroll, we have like one person creating email address, one person you know, signing them in, and then the other person is enrolling them. Um, before they, uh, our people would have hard time at different offices. One is because they don't speak the language. Second is because they don't really understand what their needs are. And so it, it takes a lot longer to help them. Well, you talked about the, the Welfare Reform Act taking Medicaid eligibility away from, from co uh, Compact or Free Association individuals. But, and that just that in December of last year, that law just changed. What has that meant for you in Hawaii? Oh my gosh, it's huge. It's probably one of the biggest accomplishment uh, we have done. We fought so many years and I even didn't expect this to happen so, so soon. Um, I mean, there were bills after bills in, introducing to reinstate Medicaid and it seems like it would just go up to the house of Rev and then it was killed there. Um, that meant a lot. I mean, now, um, so I talked about how the state removed COPA citizen from their state program, the MedQuest in 2014. With the restoration of Medicaid, they're able to take us back in. Because what it means for the state of Hawaii is that they get funding from the federal government, right? to be able to help the COVA citizens. Um, like, I mean, than before. Before they were mainly for, uh, using state resources to help the COVA citizens. And, and that was, I think, one of the reason why they made the decision to discontinue Medicaid for uh, adult or, you know, the age 19 to 64 COVA citizens. Yeah. Um, so it it seems like there is this there's this dual. You have a compact where you can come and work and live in the U.S., but yes. then you were not eligible for certain programs, and that seems like it it caused quite a a problem for for folks. That's a really good observation, and that has been my observation since even in in college when I we started school. One of the barrier we were faced with was. You know, we were all excited coming to America to re receive college education and uh, live like a legal resident in America under the compact. Um, we soon learned that no, um, we had to go every year. I remember we would lose our jobs um, because our EAD card, employment authorization card, were expired. And um, Honestly, luckily, to the kindness of our counselors, uh, they would I, I, they would take us to have us work at their house and give us twenty dollars um, that would carry out carry us out to, through a week or two. And I remember just you know keeping the twenty dollars for my snacks, <laughs> um, so that I can you know have something to eat. Um, and then we'll wait for. Uh, our counselors to also help pay for our ticket to come to Oahu, to the immigration office, to renew our EAD cards. So that was when I first learned that, okay, the compact is in place, but there are pieces of the compact that are not yet in place, right? Because mm -hmm. um, that's how I feel, not yet in place, uh, or because people don't recognize us under the compact. The compact is also a very new, um, form of governing, I guess, or a relationship that uh, a lot of, they only know immigrants and they don't understand what is compact and what are the compact uh, migrants. What does it mean to be a migrant versus an immigrant? And so when they lump us within the immigrant, immigrant group, it's so different because that's legal. It's a legal term, right? And it comes with packages of whatever, like benefits or the do's and the don'ts. <laughs> um, so I think not, so 
so we realized we need to educate people. We need to start educating people about our status and, you know, what is the compact and yeah. But then these things are our policies and they're laws. So it takes a process to make those things change. And we have to learn. And that's part of actually organizing. We are Oceania. Uh, the organizations that were, were organized before us, like Micronesian United, th these were all our elders and church leaders organizing so that we can start learning how to advocate for ourselves and making these policies change um, you know, so that um, they can recognize who we are here. So maybe just for our viewers, uh, the compact provides for uh, folks to, from the compact nations to come and live and work and study in the United States. But uh, more often than not, when you go to get your driver's license or you go to get a job, people don't recognize uh, that treaty. So having an employment authorization document is a, is a huge help because yes. it's issued by the Department of Homeland Security and it's a, it's a recognizable doc, federal ID. Um, but then also, uh, it's not required by the compact. So, but it's highly I always highly recommended it. Uh, and for yeah. a time, it was issued only for a year. But since it's been yeah. some time now that Homeland Security has now issued that document for four years, which is more helpful, and you don't have to apply every year for that document. But um, Josie, yeah. you mentioned. Um, Maybe could you talk about Partners in Development Foundation and what role they play with We Are Oceania? Thank you so much for that question. Definitely, um, you know, for We Are Oceania to be able to start, like open up our one-stop center in, in August of 2015 and in October apply for the state funding to do the healthcare enrollment it would have been impossible if we did not work with Partners in Development Foundation because we didn't have a 501c3. And so uh, Partners in Development Foundation is an organization that serves Native Hawaiians and they're very well known for their Tutu and Me program. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. And so what they, they were our mentors, uh, our sponsors for, you know, the, the grant and allowing us to be able to do all the services uh, under their fiscal sponsorship um, and, and mentoring, um, especially I would say myself, uh, to learn you know, what it takes to create a nonprofit organizations and all those pieces together uh, and understanding grant writing and uh, grant management, um, yeah. And so you are now six years old we are Oceania. Almost six years old, yes, oh, yes. And uh, six years old and attempting to now become independent and move out of our parents' house uh, in, you know, onto our own. Uh, and that projected date is March 2nd. Oh, so you'll become your own uh, nonprofit, independent so standing already, alone. We already cut our nonprofit um, and now we need to physically, you know, stand alone. Yes. Wow, that's incredible. Um, congratulations to you on that. And I, I wish you uh, good luck. I'd like to go back if we could to COVID-19. Uh, you, you explained one point to me about what happened during COVID, when, when the pandemic uh, started. What happened to We Are Oceania and to the communities you serve? Well, this, the whole state of Hawaii closed down on August, I mean, March 16th. And um, I remember vividly it was a Sunday and uh, I got the phone call that tomorrow, our centers, our whole you know, organization is closed down because the state is closing down. And so I had to like call all the staff, you know, our office is closed down. But what that did was, you know, it really changed the way we serve our community. Uh, our community for a good two months, uh, we were just reorganizing and re, uh, yeah, reorganizing how we serve our community because our door was totally closed. Um, they could not come in anymore. And our service was very open door. People would come in, sit across from you and we helped them for up to two hours, you know, like that health enrollment thing. It's not easy. It can take up to even 
the longest was seven hours for a whole big family because you know you enroll all the family members but uh it literally really changed and uh and of course our community were impacted heavily um the unemployment uh until now we struggle with that uh not it's not fast enough a lot of people didn't get their money uh some people didn't get their money until august um and so people began to experience you know like being hungry and needing um diapers for their babies needing you know formulas for their babies just a lot of things uh, on top of food um so that kind of like uh what was the norm from uh march i would say to may and then may we began to see our community members impacted heavily by covid meaning that these members of our community began to you know have covid and being positive with covid and that number just went crazy i mean it just increased almost every day there was just and of course because you know um we we live with our families right and usually we have big families and um a lot of our people were not ready also i think uh when covid hit our community um even us wow we did not have the capacity um to equip our community with you know um mask and uh whatever they need to be isolated at home um i feel that there was a disconnect in in different services that could have really helped our community but in in short it it devastated our community and we had to totally shift the way we do program um i i, I did i did see the um reports coming out of honolulu that that the fas communities were very um well pacific islander communities were very heavily impacted disproportionately yeah. impacted yeah. and devastated and exactly and you can say fas um i know when you look at the disaggregated data um and you know that part of my role was to also kind of like you know protect our community knowing how hard we are being hit by covid but also how we've been experiencing um you know just flat out discrimination um you know like a lot of the times when when it's 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 us like you get blamed for being the one spreading um covid in hawaii are the numbers still rising in terms of covid uh are they stabilizing and what are you doing on the ground now um on the ground now we so first i the numbers are actually decreasing and it's a good news um dramatically i mean like from almost 40% to now i think like 20 23 or getting low um and i we can see that from our work you know we don't have that many calls for positive cases anymore where we run out to the you know to the houses and give them mask and food and things like that or help them through the cares line so that they can get isolation in the hotels um however i think there is need uh extremely need for education continuing education and outreach to the community in the recovery um recovery stage um and and i'm also mindful that you know there's going to be another wave of covid and now we see variants of the covid and so education is still very important and and connecting the community to now the world is going on uh virtual <laughs> right uh and and trying to connect the community to be, become part of this virtual world so that that's how we're receiving information and that's how you're receiving uh going to school the kids are receiving their education that way uh so that's where the effort is going uh working on i've been um trying to do proposals we just got one from the cdc foundation to actually provide zoom uh and hotspot or myfi wifi uh connection and uh a ipad for 30 organizations uh in the hope that this organizations maybe church organizations maybe uh community organizations and maybe even lineage you know like those big huge lineages in our culture that the here it's very effective when you work through them because the you know the information go quickly and so that's my hope is to equip them 
and uh, we just got another small uh, grant to help buy computers so that we can loan to families that don't have access to computers. Um, so that's the kind of effort that we're um, focusing on now. Uh, and how about vaccinations? Where, where are you in that process? Okay, good question. That's another effort. Um, so we've been doing uh, a lot of uh, first trying to figure out the, you know, how things work and now working with the service providers who are actually doing the vaccining um, and just partnering up with them, helping them to organize that community outreach. Um, like uh, the doctor that we work with uh, of one of the health clinic, community health clinic told us, you know, we, this, it was really difficult for us to reach these people. These were actually patients of ours that we haven't seen for years. And in the two weeks you help us with the vaccine, we're able to see them again. <laughs> uh, and so he really believed in that, you know, in our model of having our community members working uh, for, you know, that it's that trust within the community and bringing the community out. So our first day we had, um, we, we had 22 people vaccinated. That's the only, you know, amount they could do. And we had like a whole total, like a long wait list. Now we have another day scheduled for next week and it's already full, not next week, this, this Friday, it's already full. And we have, I think 10 more people who are on the waiting list. So um, I'm working with two organizations here to try and catch those that are not, um, you know, cannot fit into the schedule with the health clinic. Um, and uh, I work with Project Vision and Project Vision is, contracted by the Department of Health to do the vaccine, vaccinating the community. So that's one part of it. And the other part is educating, sharing our experience and uh, you know, just sharing the facts about COVID so that our community are more uh, you know, uh, willing and not afraid. There's a lot of fear. I saw on your website, you talked about social media. I saw on your website that you're hiring people uh, who have uh, cultural competency and language skills. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that was our initiative for, um, uh, for when we got the help from city and county of Honolulu to do, you know, to be part of the COVID, to do our COVID response. And literally what we did was, you know, what we were doing um, with the community help, and with whatever little thing we could do, we formalize it by, you know, um, putting a proposal. We cut the money to, to be able to do what we call the community resource group uh, team. And then we also have the helpline team and the helpline would get, you know, would answer the phones in the different languages and, and uh, walk people through. That was really effective. Um, you know, it really helped and, um, that grant ended <laughs> ended November 30th, so we lost almost the whole you know team that we we hired on. Uh, we were able to hold on to maybe like one one eighth of that that in you know that initiative that team, and that's that's what we were asking for help with. Um, yeah, but that whole model, I mean, I think people just don't realize how with our people it's really helpful to have people that understand the language, can speak the language and also the culture. Um, yeah, and I think that's really what helps our efforts. Josie, you um, you received a, a, an award from the city and county of Honolulu when right near when you first started. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, are you talking about the, the, the funding <laughs> or the award? No, like recognition, and you've probably received more than more than once. But I think the city and the county recognized you, and and wow, and the work you're doing. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm always shy to talk about that because honestly, it's it's not just us at Wow. It's not me. It's it's all the staff that work really hard, and I want to talk about them because these people are really special. You know, when we didn't have the capacity, and we would get food from. Uh, you know, other donors, and we didn't have the manpower, I would call out for help, you know, and people came, came through uh, to help. And some of those people that came through so many times were those people we hired on, of course, because we knew that these people have the heart to help. And, um, and so um, 
for us, it was just doing our responsibility for our community and for the city and the leadership of Hawaii to recognize that. Uh, it's, it's very humbling. It's really truly a privilege to help to serve our community uh, and to be a, uh, to have their trust in us that we could help them. Yeah. So. I've, I've always been a, a believer that if, if you and, and the Micronesian communities are strong, then um, the Hawaii community at large is, is stronger for it. Um, Philippe, maybe you had a question that you'd like to ask of Josie? Thank you so much, Tanya. Josie, it's my understanding that for nearly a year now, the Compact of Free Association nations are no longer um, have open borders. So what work have you been able to do with citizens of the COPA states who aren't able to get home at this time? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, definitely. I mean, the food drives, when we got little food, we make sure that it was for the patient's house and for the people that had COVID and the people that were stranded. Um, when I hired on the staff, uh, and it's not just, you know, there were people that were stranded. A lot of them worked in our government or in our private sector back home. And they were living with families that didn't expect them to be, you know, like stuck here and it become their responsibility. So uh, a couple of staff um, were hired were people that were stranded. And that was one of my approach was to, you know, help maybe the ones that are needing the help and not only helping that one staff, but the family that they're living with, you know, because if you give them a job, then they will be able to, you know, um, yeah, contribute to the household. I know. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. Great question, Philippe. Thank you for that. Um, do Josie, do, are there still many um, folks that are stranded who need to go back? And, and what are the numbers? Um, again, for the Marshall, Marshall Islands, I know there's about 200 or maybe uh, over 200. And I also suspect the same number for FSM. When we first um, started our, our initiative to collect names, people were shy. And of course, we want to respect that. And so I didn't push it. But I, I know that there's probably like about 200, you know, over 200 FSM citizens who are stranded. Um, I know uh, Palau, we serve their Palau patient house. And th um, those patients were supposed to go home already because they were done with their treatment, but they got stuck. Um, and so they're still there. And every food, food uh, drive, we make sure that we really do it the island way, right? We make sure that we have food for the Palau house, we have food for Pond Bay house, we have food for Chuk house and, um, and where else? And, and, and the Marshall Islands house, patient's house. And for Christmas and Thanksgiving, we make sure that we also give them extra stuff. Yeah, so, and we've been really fortunate with our partnership with uh, other organizations here in Hawaii. I must say that a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of love for our people from the people of Hawaii. We got a lot of uh, donations of masks from private people, like small organizations. And it just really make us uh, feel so blessed. And, um, and I wanna say this because I want our community to know that there are people out there that truly love, you know, other people. and and that there are many kind people out there. Is there anything you wanted to, um, else that you wanted to add about COVID? I think what I, I would like to say is really shine light to the true story of how COVID had impacted our community. And we kind of talk about how we had the highest number, but you know, we were looking at PI, right? And so you're always wondering, what is the percentage out of that 4% um, PI population in Hawaii is, Micronesian population or Kova population, and uh, from my uh, from my understanding, I think there's about over a little bit over one uh, percent of the four percent PI because PI in, include other Pacific Islanders. So, for two of our community to be actually the top two, that says a lot 
-hmm. I mean, to me, COVID had really uh, impacted our community in a way that uh, it's just, it scared a lot of people. Uh, I had physicians that call and wanted to help because they've seen it firsthand in the hospital. And so with the, with the vaccine, they're really hoping that we, you know, protect ourselves with the vaccine. Looking at the number of mortality in our, our community, we made up over 50% of the PI population mortality. And so uh, it's serious. Back to communications, what, what are your main, you do have a website. So are you, do you not to use social media or what is your, what are your main channels of communication with the communities you work with? Um, definitely. So our main uh, channel of communication, there's two. One is, uh, of course, Facebook. A lot of people are on Facebook and that's how they get exposed to those great you know, social media uh, stories. Uh, and we created what we call the Island Hopper uh, talk stories, virtual talk stories. And every and that's a weekly, um, and we do update, we do education on our programs and how to apply for Medicaid, how to sign up for the vaccine, all of these things. And um, like the Island Hub, and we, we chose that name because, you know, in having our community remember, oh, what day is, is Chugi's language? What day is Panapian language? We thought it would be easy, you know, just remembering Island Hub is always Marshall Islands, Koshrai, Bonbe, and Chug, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Tuesday is Marshall Islands, Wednesday is Koshrai, Thursday is Bonbe, and Friday is Chugis language. Um, that's one. The other way is we're using our food drives and we, we create uh, flyers in the languages and put them in the food drive. And then in the boxes, you know, so we distribute uh, during the COVID, we distributed about 1,200 boxes every week. Um, yeah, and so the flyers will go out in each box. Yeah, and we had different sites of distribution, uh, Waimanalo, Wahiwa, Waianai, Waipahu, where we, we see that there's concentration of PI or Pacific Island population. And of course, at our, our office, we are Oceania. So now that we don't have the funding anymore, uh, we partner up with, uh, Chef Hui, and these are the people that I really truly am blessed that they are partnering with us because they've been blessing us with food that, you know, free food. And it's 300 every Friday, 200 cooked food on Tuesdays and 200 on Fridays. On top of that, also the boxes of produce and protein uh, that goes out to 300 families. So we continue to put the flyers in those. Um, we partner up with other outreach uh, efforts and we would put our flyers in there to also give out at different locations. I think you alluded to it, but uh, were many people in your community uh, laid off of work? Oh yes, there was a lot of people laid off of work. Uh, and I can also say uh, there were a lot of people that stayed back to work because a lot of our community members are essential workers. You know, they're the ones who are working out there in the fast food, working in the restaurants and in the, um, uh, like now school is in session. Um, so like in serving the schools, the bus companies and things like that. Yeah. Incredible, Josie. Um, do you work with uh, Micronesian communities who are in the mainland? Oh God. So yes, and I smile because when, when you say that, I'm like, yeah, uh, the, we work, I mean, we have to, we had to, and because we actually learn from them. So uh, I would say March to April and May, we were very involved in, you know, um, just hearing what's going on in Arkansas. So we have what we call the COVID task force. Um, and that's like all the, all the Compact of Free Association nations. Uh, members in Washington State, Oregon, in Arkansas, uh, um, Texas, almost all over. Uh, and then of course, the ones from Hawaii. Then we also created what we call the FSM COVID Task Force USA. Uh, and that's just within the FSM because um, I, can, I, I have to say Marshall Islands, I really admire them. 
they're always very uh, organized. And so with the COVID, they already started their own COVID, you know, the RMI COVID task force. And that's how they were communicating uh, with organizations and with, and it was really easy for me to work with them. So the first group I started, I, we began working with was the Marshall, you know, the RMI uh, COVID task force and uh, what they call the Marshallese community organization. Uh, in distributing the food, they actually, they, uh, they lead one of our distribution, food distribution during the COVID initiative. Uh, did bands and uh, all different kind of outreach. Um, but yeah, so we work closely with other communities. Um, yeah, we shared a lot of things with the Medicaid restoration. And I would say, I would do a shout out to Abihaf because Abihaf kind of created that platform for us where they bring in uh, Micronesian leaders in the different communities all across Amer I mean, United States, including Hawaii on a, Two, every two years, we come together in a conference form and talk about this, uh, this needs, that need, um, what do you call, attention from the Capitol Hill or from the federal government. Yeah. Uh, Josie, it sounds like you're working more than 80 hours a week. Seriously. <laughs> That's why I laugh because I don't think a lot of people know that. And if I say that, yes, we work with them, they're like, they're going to go, wait, so when did you find the time? But um, <laughs> I never really worked hard um, in my life until the COVID. But I would say that it's such a rewarding job that I don't feel the kind of stress that I would feel with I mean, I, I failed in, in grad school <laughs> when you're doing a paper, you're faced with a deadline. It, it, it's good kind of stress. Yeah. 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 Um, I want you to know that we're having, we're planning to have a conversation with the secretary of uh, Marshall Islands, the secretary of health in the Marshall Islands. And I look forward to hearing from him about, um, you know, repatriation and, and that, that side of the work. So uh, thank you for talking about the folks who are still stranded in, in Honolulu yeah. from, from I think all the states. That would be a really uh, good conversation. Um, I think FSM people, a lot of them are waiting and their hopes was high when they, you know, we were, they were gonna go, but then something happened and things changed. But I think RMI had done it twice so far already. So mm. um, I think, yeah, FSM gotta get on the, the roll. Uh, once wow. we feel confident, yeah. Now, uh, before we close, I wanted to ask, you have in your background a picture of, uh, will you reference the, the youth? What would you like to say about the Youth Summit? This is one of my, my proud projects, uh, giving the youth a platform, a place for where they can voice and where they can be themselves and just being empowered. Uh, and so we started that Youth Summit uh, in 2017. Uh, with the goal, target goal of at least reaching 200 of our students, it has been very positive and uh, a lot of them love the Youth Summit. Uh, this is our last Youth Summit in 2020 and there were over 500 participants, including service providers and parents and community leaders. Um, so the youth look for it every, every, um, every year. And I can also say that some of the youths that came to the first one, they're now in college. So the whole goal of empowering the youths and uh, lining them up with career goals, because I mean, not everybody's gonna go to college, but at least, you know, like bring them, make them aware of the different careers that they can, um, they can seek. And also like to find their own story, who am I and what are my potentials and seeing them as, you know, a light of our community. Um, before we close, I just want to say we've been talking to Josie Howard of We Are Oceania. Thank you so much for all of the time and all of the important work that you do. You are touching uh, very directly people's lives in, in critical and such important ways. Uh, we wish you all the best as you go forward, uh, continuing to do this important work as we continue to fight back and fight uh, COVID-19. That's an important uh, goal of the new administration, President Biden administration. So uh, I, I hope and look forward to us being able to work with you more going forward. 
Um, did you have any final words that you want to share with us? Oh my gosh. Um, what can I say then just to be grateful to God for the gift of life and grateful to you for all the support and all the work. I mean, I think we all, um, I, I'm very proud of just doing the work in that area that I can contribute to the bigger work that everyone is doing, including our nations uh, and, you know, and what you do on the federal level. So um, thank you very much and uh, look forward to a prosperous 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josie.